employ him on that. We are going to employ him on that. And I just let us say, you know, big thanks and appreciation for everyone that came out of there, you know, left their business schedule to make it, make sure they are here to be part of this unique meeting. And our the caucus is on the 15th. And we know that people have been networking and mobilizing people. So, you know, so we just say thanks to everyone. And I'm glad that you all could make it tonight. And welcome. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Marie, for the kind introduction. And certainly, I want to extend my gratitude to each and every one of you that are joining us live tonight, both on the Zoom and those in the broader social media audience uh, online. We're very grateful that you've uh, tuned in tonight. Just grab a cup of coffee, grab some hot tea, and just sit back and enjoy, because I think you're going to really uh, understand who we are, what we're about, why we're surging in Iowa, and, uh, and just you'll see a better tomorrow, a better future for the United States of America, a better future for your children, a place where, uh, where we'll be safe again, a place where we're able to uh, be free again and where things are just be right. There's just a general sense in America and around the world that things just aren't right, that we're living in a time where things are upside down and things seem a bit crazy. And no matter who you are, most people came in to 2024 saying, you know, I just have this feeling in my stomach that something's just off and something, uh, some major things are going to happen in 2024. And you're not wrong. Uh, there will be major events happen in 2024 that will shake the very bedrock of what every uh, most every person thinks they know to be true. And uh, so many people will be confused in that time. And uh, But America will have a leader that is stable, that understands, that already knows those kind of things are coming and how to lead through them, uh, which will give great comfort to so many people who who will be in a time of turmoil. So we're going to have a wonderful night together. I want you to type your questions in the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, we'll be taking, I really want to take uh, several questions at the end of tonight and our time together to just to hear uh, back and forth with those that uh, are on our Zoom. And if you have them on social media, we'll try to collect some of those questions for a, a later uh, broadcast. But uh, I want to just start off tonight and just kind of share my story. It's something that we haven't done on any of the times that we've we've met together. Uh, you know, I grew up in the mountains of West Virginia. Uh, my father uh, is a pastor, uh, and he's also a state senator. When I was growing up, he wasn't a state senator. He was just, we had uh, the small church and a, a very small uh, Christian school. And in fact, when we first came to West Virginia, uh, I think that his church was running about 100 people. The school had about 40, 42 kids. And uh, it just did not look like it was going to be able to continue. Uh, things weren't very well uh, financially for the ministry. And uh, but God has done a wonderful work in West Virginia. And it's a thriving campus today and a vibrant church. And the school uh, is literally this year has its highest enrollment ever. Uh, and it's really exciting, everything that's happening there. But when I was growing up, it wasn't that way. So, for example, uh, when I played basketball, we did not have a gymnasium. We had blacktop. And then we had the the goals outside that were kind of, you know, the rims were bent and the 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 asphalt was had a dip in it. So you never really got to practice your your, your shots uh, because then we'd go play schools that actually had gymnasiums, obviously. Uh, but let me just think about this scenario because it was snowing. It was cold. Uh, in the winter time during basketball season, and we're practicing outside. We're shoveling the snow off the basketball court in order to practice. So that was the way I uh, grew up in, uh, in in high school and things. And then, you know, a few years after I got out, they uh, uh, really just started growing and uh, were able to get the gymnasium. And it's just been wonderful to see uh, all that's happened. I went off to a Bible college and got my bachelor's degree. But while I was there, uh, my literally just a few months into uh, college, uh, I realized that um, uh, that I needed to to learn how to invest money. I had never, you know, in the holler, you uh, they'll they'll feed you for bailing hay all day. Uh, but when I was at college, I was making seven dollars an hour and thought I'd hit the jackpot. 
I mean, I thought I was really rolling in the dough, the most money I'd ever had. And so I thought I need to know how to properly invest this, like the parable of the talents and how do I multiply this and grow this? And so I couldn't afford a lot of books. So I went to uh, a bookstore and on the, on Saturdays and would uh, just sit in there and read all of the books in the investing section that I could every Saturday. Well, after about two or three months of that, uh, you get tired of reading about it and you're ready to do it. Uh, and I took action. And so uh, over the next year, uh, 18 months, I actually ended up accumulating quite a bit of real estate, uh, several million dollars worth, actually, uh, of, of real estate uh, portfolio. And a lot of rentals and flips and, you know, uh, commercial and, and uh, residential. And uh, so, it, but I'm 19 years old. Um, and, you know, so it was an interesting uh, journey from an early age. When I graduated college, I graduated in five semesters. Uh, and so most people, you know, cram a four-year degree into six. Uh, I, I went the other direction. I, I, I uh, because I just, I, I realized what I wanted to be doing and um, it was almost in the way, but I wanted to have a bachelor's degree. So I, I, I started taking uh, getting permission to take over 20 credit hours per semester. And then I was working a full-time job. So I'd go to school from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., depending on the, the course. And then uh, I'd be at work from 3, uh, 3.30 or 4 to 11 or 12. And then I'd wake up and I did that. That was my life. Uh, but five semesters, I graduated my bachelor's degree, um, ended up losing absolutely everything a couple of years later. Uh, and that really taught me a whole lot. Um, I, I remember a lot of the lessons from that. It actually was kind of what inspired uh, my first book. It was really just principles and lessons that I had learned that I better not forget again. Uh, and so that's what that was about. And then, uh, so I had to get a job to rebuild. And that's when I got a job uh, with Choice Point, which is, uh, was a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company. And uh, we ended up having uh, uh, many employees. I had many employees under under me uh, at that organization uh, as an executive uh, there and then went and I started during that time, got my master's degree from Liberty University and graduated with that in 2007. Uh, but in 2005, Choice Point had a data breach. It, they were the first company to really go public with a data breach. That was, uh, and that was 125,000 records names uh, in California uh, is where that took place. And uh, there was no pers uh, what they call SPII, sensitive personal identifiable information uh, leaked or anything like that, but um, uh, names, address, things like that, 125,000. Ironically, you know, since then we have where there's like 30 million data breach and it's your credit cards and your, your social security numbers. Uh, the Veterans Administration, the VA is one of the biggest in U.S. history, and most universities are the biggest, uh, uh, have had more breaches than any uh, most any of the companies. So it's very interesting to see how data breaches have progressed since then. But we were the first, so it was a big deal. Uh, it was in the news, our stock tanked. Um, we It was a trying time. I was one of the one, because of the the the, diff, the division that I was, was running um, at the time, uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of call center employees uh, that were taking calls for different states and vital records and so forth. And so we mobilized, we were going to hire an additional 300 agents to be able to take calls specifically answering questions related to the data breach. And uh, Choice Point, you know, ended up testifying before Congress, getting different uh, legislation passed to uh, prevent, to help uh, at least require companies uh, and organizations to notify consumers when they their information had been breached. So there was a lot of things that we did to protect consumers out of that. Um, but that's what got me into data security and cybersecurity and uh, all things technology really was that. And that was the last couple of years that I was with Choice Point. Then I went to another technology company, a senior executive there with uh, a hardware, software, software as a service, uh, you know, and then obviously moving into the IoT, Internet of Things and so forth. Went and then was CEO of a nutraceutical company, one of the largest uh, uh, manufacturing companies, largest harvesters of blue-green algae in the world, uh, and was a was the president of that company. Uh, and we had their first, they had been declining in revenue for 15 straight years and uh, literally month not over, not just year after year, month after month after month, had been declining in revenue. And uh, after I was there for 90 days, we had their first growth month in 15 years. 
Uh, and that at the height was over a $400 million company. Uh, and then I, uh, when I left that company, I ran for state Senate in 2012, started my own company. Uh, and uh, part of that was uh, some nutraceutical products um, and especially a baby formula because Lauren, our youngest uh, daughter, my, my youngest daughter at the time, uh, could not uh, take baby formula. Uh, and so we, uh, it was messing with her stomach. And so uh, it was the most natural organic uh, baby formula that uh, the closest thing to breast milk that I could uh, formulate. And uh, all of a sudden it, uh, it really did well for her and a lot of picky babies. And so that, that started another company. And so I was doing that until uh, 2014 and, uh, and then also in 20 into 2015, being the CEO of the hoverboard company, uh, the, the, uh, in 2014, in the beginning of 2015 there, uh, or 2015 and 2016, and then uh, the patent sold. And then I, that's actually what launched me into everything that I'm doing today. Uh, I ended up in Spain on the island of Menorca uh, at the request of uh, an organization uh, that was bringing the top 20 startup companies in the world together. They were, were really searching to bring the highest caliber so that they could fund them. They were really promoting entrepreneurship in Spain. And they wanted uh, some of the best and brightest to relocate their companies and say, hey, look how great it is you know, living here. And don't you want to build your life? Uh, in your business here. And uh, I'm telling you, a month on the island of Menorca, you know, is, is quite convincing. Uh, and so it was a wonderful time. And while I was there, I met another gentleman who was with the White House at the time. And uh, we became friends. And and uh, a few months after uh, that, some months later, he invited me to uh, speak at Harvard University uh, to 130 uh, world leaders uh, from 32 countries. And uh, by the time I came off that stage, Literally, I, I was at the next to last step and there were already three different countries lined up wanting to uh, engage in some type of consulting uh, to move forward. And so that's what launched a lot of my work in government and helping economies and nations uh, on good governance. And of course, since then, 20, 2017 uh, and, and 2018, uh, you know, with the U.S.-China trade war, uh, Bloomberg, I was going to give a speech at their a uh, conference in Shanghai called the Year Ahead. It's got like a futurist conference, what's coming uh, in business. And so uh, I was going to be speaking at that. And then I went, uh, was asked to come early and address uh, business and government leaders in Tiananmen Square in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, China. Uh, and the day before I flew out, they, uh, they messaged me and said, we want you to talk about the US-China trade war. Well, first of all, I was supposed to speak on Wednesday and President Trump was meeting Xi Jinping for the first time on Saturday. And so I thought, my goodness, I don't want to start, uh, you know, World War III here. I don't want to start uh, the trade war uh, because of something I say. I don't know what this administration's policies were uh, and, and had not been briefed uh, on any of that. And so uh, I went through the proper channels and just said, hey, this is what they're wanting me to talk about. They gave me the green light to go ahead and to, to address this body in the Great Hall of the People. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I spoke on the US-China trade war and I spoke on intellectual property theft uh, and, and other issues that uh, we have uh, with China. And so it was a good, uh, a very good time. I, I, I did uh, sit and represent uh, on behalf of the United States, several diplomatic roundtables during that time. Uh, I was the only American there and most of the others were ambassadors from other countries to China. Uh, and so it was a very, uh, a very, a, an interesting time for us to learn each other in what they valued versus what we valued. Uh, our how we defined what is ethical was completely opposite, which creates interesting problems and challenges. Because if I think being honest is a virtue, and you think being deceitful is a virtue, then I have to know everything that you say. You think you're a great person the more deceitful you are, and I think you know, I'm a better person, the more honest that I am. And so in business, these things collide. And so it was a very productive conversation. And I, I remember what one of the government officials said to me as I left, he said, uh, he said, you know, we don't agree. Uh, we, we don't agree on a whole lot of things. But he said, I appreciate the spirit in which you said these things. He said, we can we can dialogue and converse because you're not mean spirited. Uh, and so I, I found that very, very interesting. And I think that's always the way we should be, uh, is we have to be able to be able to converse 
without being mean spirited about things. That's a, something we have lost in the United States of America today, uh, even in politics and about hardly anything. Uh, if if it's either this way or this way, or you're done, you're out, you're canceled. Uh, and that's that's not a way to live. And so uh, I went from that into uh, doing a lot of work in Africa. Uh, I've done work in different countries, uh, not only in Africa, but around the world. Uh, and And we were focusing on water and education in Africa. Uh, and then that morphed into, because of some work I was still doing in technology on cybersecurity, data security, and artificial intelligence, uh, that morphed into doing some national security work uh, for some of the governments and uh, really looking at, uh, at artif the future of artificial intelligence, uh, defense systems, weapons, and so forth, and the threat that they pose, how to prevent it, uh, how to counteract it, and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, we got into information wars, which is a lot of AI generated uh, material, the deep fakes uh, with videos. Uh, this is not a deep fake. It is me actually speaking. But I can tell you that the deep fake videos, you would not know the difference. And if if they put the words in my mouth that can start a war because words, words start wars, uh, then, uh, you know, that's that's obviously a problem. So we had to be able to uh, governments need to be able to tell which videos are authentic or not. And uh, so that was that's been my journey. And then, of course, on the uh, on a U.S. delegation to South Sudan uh, with some great Congress people and ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors, uh, it was bipartisan. So it was half Democrat, half Republican, uh, uh, usually about six uh, Congress people, three ambassadors and me. Some of them were Congress people and ambassadors uh, at different parts of their career. And uh, so it was just a wonderful time to be able to to talk about things because our conversations in were nothing like what you hear on TV in the way the media kind of pits one against the other. Uh, we're we're sitting together talking through the night in in Istanbul or in Juba or you know Qatar or wherever we are in the world, uh, uh, and we did it in all of those places and and, and just be able to talk about the things that were creating so much division here, but we were able to, to have the conversation uh, very civilly and actually hurt each other. And so it was uh, it was a great time uh, to be able to see things both from the domestic side and foreign policy side. Uh, and uh, so we still do a lot uh, for Africa and in Africa, that's where uh, most of my work was with Transform Africa. And so uh, we started Roland College, a Kingdom School of Business and Entrepreneurship. We graduated uh, 2,451 students from that in Africa last year in 2022. And so we're very grateful for the impact uh, in the lives of young people in Africa that we're having. So that's a little bit about uh, my background. And then, of course, uh, this uh, last year, God calling me to run for president of the United States because America is just going the wrong direction. Uh, and I saw American corruption uh, as it relates to individuals, uh, people like Carlos Cardon uh, of Chile, where the United States burned someone who was a good friend to the United States for many years, and uh, obviously Julian Assange, uh, not even a citizen of the United States, but uh, has has absolutely wrecked and ruined someone's life for embarrassing us. Uh, and instead of fixing the problem, we want to fix him. And that's just wrong. Uh, and then we've been done wrong by so many different countries. Uh, we have improperly sanctioned many countries. We have nefariously sanctioned countries. There were assets in different countries that we wanted to get our hands on. And because we could not, or because someone else was going to be given them, we utilized uh, the, our bully pulpit with our monetary being the reserve currency of the world uh, that was the most coveted form of currency. And uh, we used that against people and it, it has worked and we manipulated people and abused people because of our powerful position as the leader of the free world uh, for so many decades that uh, and nobody who gets abused, think about in a relationship. If someone's been getting beat on for years and years, they may want to get out desperately bad and they may want to speak about it, but they can't because they get beat yet again. But the moment that they are empowered, the moment that those ties are severed, that they know their well-being is going to be cared for, they know that financially they're taken care of, and they've got a different future, then it all comes out because they have nothing to lose. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is what is happening around the world right now. 
when you hear of BRICS, uh, that's one of the, the biggest alliances and fastest growing alliances of nations that is the opposite of, of what the United States, anything we do, it's pretty much going to do the opposite. And I'm not against that because we created that. That's our fault that there even needed to be a BRICS. And so those are the kind of things which is bad for our national security. It's bad for our economic security. It is bad for every single one of your 401ks. It's bad for our stock market. Uh, it's bad for the US dollar. It's bad for our debt. And it's bad for our position in the world. And the answer is to stop doing wrong by other people and other nations. Uh, and, and yet we find ourselves in a recent situation just two, three weeks ago where we did the same thing against one of the poorest countries in the world, Liberia. What are we doing? One of the most prosperous nations on earth going and just just in, just to uh, just to leverage uh, our position because we can, because we didn't get our way. We literally are like a, stomping our feet like a, a two-year-old toddler uh, that didn't get the toy that we wanted. And so we're going to take it out on people. Uh, and we do that all over the world. Uh, a lot of the emotional quotient and intelligence uh, of people who may get to make these decisions is very low. Uh, they, they make decisions based on their feelings and based on shockingly uh, very little wisdom. Uh, it's, it's very much toddler-like in elementary school. like and, and I don't think that's much of a surprise to you because if you listen to uh, politicians or if you listen to candidates, even the presidential candidates right now, listen to them talk about one another. You'll literally think that they're running for seventh grade class president and that we're back in elementary school. Well, she said this and well, he did that. So I'm going to do this and the one upping of each other and outdoing each other. It's just child play. It's and that's why people say it's like we live in a simulation. This is this is ridiculous. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, I agree. And that's why I'm running for president. Uh, and so America, my prayer is that America wakes up uh, because voting for me is voting for yourself. I, don't, I did not come from the establishment cloth. Uh, in fact, the RNC uh, really uh, from, from, from early on rejected us because we weren't going to play the, the silly games. I wanted to run an honorable campaign for president. I wasn't going to pander to different groups during the primary and then shift my positions to uh, in the general to win the general. I wanted to be authentic and honest and keep my integrity from day one in running for president. My positions were my positions were my positions. Um, and uh, that's not the way that game is played. And so we had to start running outside of the system, running outside of the game. Uh, and of course, why not? Especially the more rigged a game is, why would you play it? If I have to stay in the lines and you get to run outside of the lines, jump in the end zone, and that touchdown counts, that's not a fun game to play. So why would we do that anyway? And so it's really great to see how God has led our campaign. We knew it would be different from day one. We know it's going to continue to look different and be different. But where the United States of America is now uh, and where it will be, it will be in a place that we have not seen in our lifetime. Uh, this election will be something that's different than we've ever seen in our lifetime. And the stage is being set and, uh, and and so we are running because America needs God. I don't believe any one politician is the answer. I don't believe any one uh, piece of legislation is the answer. I believe that all of that does matter, but none of it matters if God is not where he belongs in America again. And that is the the first and foremost, because he said, righteousness exalts a nation, not brilliant politicians, not super smart people, not super rich people, not people who are elites and, and, and know more than everybody else. No, he said righteousness exalts a nation. So, and everybody doesn't have to go out and be righteous. He just, he, he calls on his people, the people who, who confess him to do what they're supposed to do and be who they're supposed to be. Sadly, there's many who do profess that don't seem to live like it or act like it, which is what's confused so many people in America. Well, why don't we have the blessing. Why are we in such a mess? And it's because 
If righteousness is exalted nation and we're not being exalted, we have to look inward. We have to be better. And so that's that's what challenges me uh, every day is to be the best that I can be, to be what I'm supposed to be uh, for you and for him. Uh, and so, you know, I love running a campaign where I'm not beholden to anyone. I'm not beholden to any interest group. I'm not beholden to any donors. I'm not beholden to any foreign powers. I'm not beholden to any lobbyists. And normally you have to be, that's how you become elected president. If you name every single one of my opponents uh, in this presidential race, you, you already probably know the answer. And I could fill in the blanks of exactly who they are each beholden to. That's why they say certain things and they don't care whether you like it or not. They know it's going to be divisive, but they are pleasing certain people who are sitting there going, yes, that's right. That's my person right there. And so that is where where uh, where our campaign comes in. People who want one of you, someone who, who can make the right decisions. Have you ever sat back and said, is this really the best options we have? Is this for president? Is this really the best of America? I think I could randomly go into most cities in America, pull five CEOs of companies and have better options for president of the United States than what we generally have. That's a fact. And yet we keep ending up with, with lesser than or, or worse, uh, evil options. And I will close with this. I believe that my candidacy and the miracle in Iowa that's going to happen one week from Monday is going to pull down strongholds across the entire United States. It's going to pull down strongholds. There's going to be breakthroughs. The chains will be broken. The entire national political conversation, the entire national uh, political landscape will change completely because it is God time. It is go time, it is God time. And it is your time, it is our time. We have to do what has never been done before. We need to mobilize 10 plus thousand people in Iowa in nine days, ladies and gentlemen. We need them to show up on January 15th or nothing counts, nothing else matters. But let me tell you, I, I mentioned either last night or the night before when I was speaking uh, with you that God will do whatever he has to do. And I, I, uh, I said, if there has to be a winter storm, if there has to, whatever happens, he will do whatever he has to do as we do our part. We'll listen to this. About 30 minutes before the start of this, I got what the, what the weather is supposed to be on January 15th. The low in Iowa, and I saw for Des Moines, Sioux City, and several other cities, um, and the it ranged some some of the reports had it uh, down at negative two, and then some as high as negative twenty. Uh, but there was a broad range, negative two to negative twenty degrees. That's not the wind chill. That's the temperature. The wind chill may be forty or minus forty or minus fifty. I mean, cars don't start at that point. I'm telling you. The miracle in Iowa is happening. And if you do your part, we will win decisively, come from behind. They don't see us coming They do, they, because they're not looking out in the fields. They're not looking at the shepherd boys. They're not looking at the, the little people. They don't even recognize us. So they'll never see us coming. God has hit us intentionally so that we can make this surge. And so I am grateful to every one of you who is on tonight, who is watching uh, by whatever means and method. We are glad to have you here. We are very grateful. And uh, I'm, I, I'm just so excited to see what God is going to do. So with that, I'd like to turn it to uh, several of you. We want to introduce several guests. If you have a guest on the Zoom that you want to introduce, uh, maybe raise your hand uh, so that we're able to see that. Uh, but I want to kick off tonight with Dr. Shirley Clark, our campaign manager, uh, a strong woman of God, and just someone I'm very grateful for. Uh, Dr. Clark, go ahead and share share a word for tonight. 
Amen. Thank God for you hearing the Lord. Let me just say, I said, I need to speak out to Dr. Roberts. He has never asked me to speak right after because here's you have laid out everything. There is no excuse in this hour for us doing the right thing as believers. I was sitting in thinking about the Cyrus anointing. So many of us, I've been working the campaign and, and just talking with different Christians, you know, and so we've got to get beyond just following the crowd. You know, we the book you talked about, Dr. Robert, the truth versus the tribe. This is what I'm running into. And the truth is for the believers, the Bible says the righteousness is the nation. And so, and so if you can, you have to make a decision whether to follow the word of the Lord or some tribe, are you really hearing God? I, the, the word of God, it's a surest word of prophecy. And that is that now when you find someone, and let me just say this, uh, I've been praying for years against this uh, God needing to use a Cyrus anointing. Why, and I talk, went to God and before I, Dr. Roberts, I knew he was running for president. I was just for years, and I've been invited to the White House when uh, uh, Trump was in, and I chose not to go. Uh, this for several reasons. But one thing I've learned is that I said, God, you cannot be this deadbeat that you, in general, overall, our presidents and things, they have a, a like you said, uh, Dr. Rowling, you talked about, you, you, you come on, those of us that really know God, we know where the people really know God when they just say it. You know, and and that's what we've been getting a lot of lip service. Uh, this man of God knows God. He know the word of God. He know the scriptures. He know the, come on, can we just say the names of the, the you know, the, the books of the Bible. And so what we have to do now is challenge believers. Let's not look for the Cyrus anointing. Let's look for the one that has the anointing of God on his life. And that is the one he's just laid out his life before us. And this is the thing that we need to know for the newcomers in the room. I said the one in the back, the one just joined it. And perhaps you playing with your cell phone. I need to listen. Dr. Roberts checks the box for Christ, character, competency, and collaboration working together. One of the things Dr. Roberts shared with us, even in the area of character, he chose a woman of God. Someone, he met his wife, he said, his, and I'm going to land this plane, but this is so important that we understand he, he is, his life is being led by God and he attaching himself to things, not just you know anything people say. He's choosing to follow God in everything in his life at this point. He found his wife on the knees. He chose the woman that was on her knees. He said that he was invited to be a spiritual advisor for one, I think it's a Miss America pageant. United States, yeah. United States, a pageant. And he said he went there, and you know, a pageant, you got women looking all kinds of way. But he saw a woman over on the, like on the floor, almost kneeling down. He didn't thought maybe something was wrong. And see, this is, this is, uh, this is character. Wanting to do right, wanting to have the right people attached to you. He said he started the person, which is his wife now, Rebecca. And she was down on the floor on her knees, praying on the stage that the ladies wouldn't fall. She works with the pageantry, been in the industry a lot. So you can't, and she's been on covers of magazines, been on uh, in Science in uh, New York Time and all of these things. But she chose to be in the industry and to walk faithfully with God. He said, when she told him what she was doing, he said to her, he said in his heart, this is the woman I want. I, he found somebody that was seeking God, someone that was on their knees. This is righteousness that exalts a nation. And I want the challenge to believers to not look for the Cyrus anointing. Do what the Bible say. Don't just go with tribe, go with truth tonight. Proverbs says, it talks about 29 to I'm talking about who rules the matter. The righteous are when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bears the people, the, the people mourn. Less it's a nation who God is the Lord. We've got no more sorrows anointed. I'm challenged every believer that's listening right now. We'll hear this. I want you to know this, this is a time to lay aside the, the sorrows anointed. 
Get the one. I told God, there's no way that you always got to use people that have know you. Can we find somebody that's totally committed to this cause, totally committed with you? And one of the things people, and when I went to someone initially, and I'm landed here, Dr. Roberts, when I went to some of my people that actually in the party, and I told them, and this is the problem, I told them about you were running, and they immediately said, and they said, how do you know? I said, the Lord, he, he said, the Lord has called me in this season. They immediately said he was not going to win. You know why? Because most of the people who say this, they were, they're not competent. So we're not used to God raising up someone that know him at the level that Dr. Roberts walks in. He's at, went to Bible school, and then he has the skill sets. And this is the problem. So, so people get nervous when people say, the Lord told you, you to run. Dr. Roberts heard from God. He's attached himself. He got character. He's a prayer warrior. He said, we get up and pray between 3.30 and 7. When I go in the White House, I want to take that with me. The same discipline. See, this is, this is what I need you to know. He's coming first with the righteousness of God. And then all of the, the other conferences and nations and collaboration spirit, he's got more of this than any candidate I know right now to work with nations. And so we, the Bible talks about having where the anointed flows, where there is unity. He knows how to do this. So I want to challenge people to work in truth and vote truthfully through truth and righteously and not just look for the Cyrus anointed. Come on, I need the believers to rise up and do what the word of God says. Amen, amen. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. I, I uh, you know, amen. I thought that when people of faith heard, it saw the business in my government and that presidents sought my counsel uh, and in the ways of good governance and ruling justly and righteously in the fear of God uh, for a free society and to better and improve the lives of everyone. Uh, I thought people would be really excited. I thought they'd be like, finally, finally. Right. And it's so, it has been so enlightening to see the darkness that is over people's eyes. The enemy has done such a great job to blind people. But I go back and I'm so thankful for Gideon's 300. You know, the rest of the people in, that were in his army, they had just won a major war. Uh, the other 30,000 that had to go home, uh, they weren't, and that's the ones that weren't afraid. Those were the ones that, uh, you know, uh, just didn't, they they drank from the, the river instead of lapping it up. And so they're still good people. They just, they didn't get it. They were still blinded. They didn't understand the actual war they were in. And so they didn't understand that you always have to be vigilant. You just won a war, but there's another one around the corner. And so you're trying to rest on your laurels and it's no time to rest at all. And so I can tell you, I believe that people with under your leadership and the people that are here in Iowa, uh, it is Gideon's 300. And uh, if he has to make the sun stand still, or in our case, make the cars not start, not start because it's minus you know, 20 degrees that night. And only our people uh, who will caucus for us, you know, their cars work and, and everyone else has done whatever he has to do. He will do because his, the purposes, uh, his purposes will not be disappointed. Uh, he has never lost. And so, uh, uh, and, and so we, we, we rest in that. Uh, so thank you for that. I want to give uh, Dr. Melody Garcia, if you would uh, give just a brief word and then uh, also introduce uh, the, your, your guest tonight uh, and then uh, for him to be able to say a brief word of support as well. Thank you. I actually have two guests and I'm sorry I can't come to the camera right now, but I've been listening since yesterday. I wanted to actually talk about um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, which just aligns with what you were talking about, Dr. Roland, about you know um, yesterday when you said Christians believe that their private faith is publicly irrelevant. Dr. Shirley even, you know, we're canvassing within our, the believers, but we also have to remember that we are fishers of men. Oftentimes our marketplace is outside the church and the Christian because they're also looking for the truth at this time. So I go back to second Peter chapter one, verse 21, that says for prophecy never came by the will of man, 
but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is the only platform in every single presidential campaign where we know and we believe that the Holy Spirit and God had given the order for Dr. Roland Roberts to run for U.S. president for a very big reason. The win is there. I've always been saying it's a president. He's the president of nations, not just the United States with every changes that's now happening. No one believed Noah that the flood was coming. Took 123 years. Even when we talk about the prophecies over our lives, we even have our own brothers and sisters in faith questioning, are we really hearing God? Well, we're not to question if Dr. Roland heard God. We are to come into alliance and collaboration and know because the evidences of his impact and his life journey he shared tonight is all pointing that this is Holy Spirit led. So I'd like to go ahead and just confirm that. You know, when two or more are gathered in his name, and there is a lot of us this evening, both here virtually and the videos being shared, all in agreement that for such a time as this, with all the chaos going on in the world, there is a new David that has been called forward to leave God's armies, God's children back to the throne. I do have two guests here. We have Michael Lenardi, who's part of the UNICEF Orlando team. There's also Hilary Manasse, all the way in Kenya. And support and just to share um, good news, Hillary and his business partner, her name is Eunice, is writing a blog post from my, my understanding from last night's video and continuing to observe. They are ru running the blog, not only in their Kenyan church, it goes up to the national level and international level. So God is moving, who is Dr. Roland in different nations, but not in the traditional sense. I wanted to give that. Michael, if you wanna, if you're able to, Go ahead and just say hello. And I know you might be driving, but if you can just unmic yourself and Hillary Manessa from Kenya, uh, feel free to say hello if, if you wish to. And it was good to see everybody here. Good evening, Dr. Roll. Dr. Good can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good, good evening, Dr. Roll. And, and uh, um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to, to hear from you again. Um, I'm actually driving right now, so I won't be able to say much. So I've just been pretty much listening to what you say. So um, all I can say is that uh, while you have my full support and, and uh, you are right, that's what I encourage also with a lot of believers to step up and, uh, uh, and, and lead you know, uh, in this country. That's it. That's all I can say. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you for your support. I appreciate you. Uh, Hillary, would you like to say a word? I know you're. Uh, it's quite early in the morning. If in Kenya, I think it's almost 3:48 a.m. or so. Welcome. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, blessings, everybody, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure, Your Excellency, just to to get to say a word on this platform. We are really super excited. We are turned on um, just to make sure that uh, the very least we can do to alert you and then um, to just push anything we can do through our countries, through uh, uh, what we know best, the social platforms, just to make sure that we add value to your presidency. We are really excited to be part of you in prayer, in solidarity. We know what you've been doing in Africa through Transform Africa. Things Amen. that are making a great deal of change through clean water and uh, just empowering communities and societies that are so down, so down to earth. So if God uses you, if God elects you high in the most powerful seat in America, that would be the greatest thing the world can ever know. And you are very right. That America indeed needs God. There is no any other powerful word than that. No candidate is offering that. 
and this is why we are we are so turned on both in prayer and we are activating our networks just for prayer and then going hard for social networks just to make sure that anything we do the smallest thing you can never do just to make you be there be in that seat it will be a miracle we want associated with thank you so much thank you so much team let's do everything we can do to make sure that this man of god rises to that seat thank you so much it's a pleasure it's a great pleasure just to be to be on this platform thank you thank you thank you Excellent. thank you so much mr hillary we are very grateful for you and your words very astute uh, and, and really somber because I believe that from the years that I was working in Africa, really trying to do a lot of these things in Africa, unite Africans, unite, strengthen the economies, uh, strengthen their influence in the world. Uh, and for having the third largest population in the world, not even being at the G20, not having any representation whatsoever. And I remember, uh, the day that it dawned on me that one of the best things I could do for Africa and the, in the nations of Africa was to be the president of the United States. So I was doing all of the work there. And then I thought, wow, he now has me doing this, but I saw how other ways that I can bless Africa as a result. And so I'm so grateful for, for your support and many of those that are standing in prayer and, and uh, certainly solidarity. But uh, the prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that prayer changes things. Uh, and there's evidence of that over and over and over. And so uh, I don't discount that at all. In fact, uh, I will say this this brief story that the Lord brought to my mind even when when I was surrendering to the call to run for president. I remembered after 9/11, which was a, a horrific time in the United States, the amount of pain, confusion that many Americans faced. And it happened 9-11 between 9 o'clock and, you know, 9-17 a.m. when the second plane hit the World Trade Center, the, the second tower. And my first daughter, firstborn daughter, was born in between the two crashes on 9-11-2001. So I'm bringing a child into the world at the same time I'm thinking the world is exploding and crumbling. And but by uh, 11 o'clock that morning, all planes were required to be grounded by 4 p.m. that day. All planes were grounded, commercial aircraft and only uh, the defense planes uh, were flying around. And I can tell you that uh, on Wednesday morning, they knew we were going to have to the destruction was so bad, the devastation so great and the grief so heavy that they had to have a national prayer service. They knew we have to. And so uh, George Bush and Condi Rice and some of the others, they were planning it for Friday, okay, 48 hours later from when they were this, this was being discussed. And as they were talking about and, and going through the planning and preparation, they said, we can't have a national prayer service for this horrific event uh, without having... Uh, the great evangelist uh, be there and uh, Billy Graham. He had to be there, but his health was failing and uh, he was not going to be able to travel by, by vehicle. And so they had to send a plane, except all the planes were grounded and no one could get FAA clearance to get him in the air. And I, I but it never was lost on me that for, that period of time, they ended up getting it worked out uh, by Thursday. And for an hour and a half, 
there was one civilian aircraft in the sky carrying one man that they said the entire nation was the answer to the healing for the entire nation at that time. And I remember during, while I was surrendering to the call, I said, God, if I'm supposed to be that man for America at this time, then I'll walk in it and, uh, and be what you want me to be to, to, to save America. And so that's, that's where I, I'm coming from on it. And so I appreciate the prayer. I know what that does. I want to introduce uh, someone tonight also, uh, if you would kindly un unmute and, and share your camera. But uh, Khon Balu, uh, Khon uh, is a great support. Uh, he actually facilitated uh, some of the delegation uh, trips and so forth. But I would like for you to, if you would, uh, are able to give a quick word of greeting tonight. Welcome to the call. Yeah, hello, hi, thank you for having me. Sorry, my camera doesn't work. I'm still here at my office at work. Haven't got it installed. Um, yeah, my name is Khan Blue. I'm originally from South Sudan. I immigrated to the US in 2001. I uh, graduated high school and then I joined the United States Marine Corps. I uh, had multiple deployment to, to Iraq, went to Afghanistan, came back and got uh, medically retired. So now I have a trucking company really close to Iowa. We're from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I have actually about six employees from Iowa. And I work with uh, Mr. Albino, uh, Ambassador Albino, and uh, uh, basically facilitated the logistics side of uh, getting uh, Dr. Roberts to Africa with the rest of the, uh, the delegates a few years ago to help with the peace and, and everything else. It was, it was very it was very nice. Ones. I was honored to be a member, part of that. Uh, so uh, t today I've got, uh, I've talked to Ambassador Alvino and he actually uh, showed me a website. I was reading everything. I liked everything over there. And I have a lot of people from Iowa. I have a sister that lives there. I have some other family members. And I, um, I'm just excited to uh, share the word. I think we still have time that I can uh, help out in any way, fashion, and anything I can. Uh, I'll be here. Everything. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. I want to point you out to, in the chat group. There's a few links that they've provided for you. Uh, the first is the Google spreadsheet of the caucus locations. That's really important. Uh, so no matter where you live in Iowa, you can click on that sheet and you can look at all the different locations and the one nearest you, it's probably only 10 or 15 minutes at most. Uh, there's there, Most people are within a very short distance of a caucus location. Sometimes it's in church basements. Some of them are in school classrooms or school gymnasiums or community room. So just look at uh, your city and your city uh, and the location nearest you uh, and sign up so that we know uh, we'll have someone there who can look and say, okay, did all these people show up? So we know how many votes we will have that night, how many people will caucus for us. We need one person at each location that is designated to stand up and nominate me and to share for a couple minutes on why everyone there should vote Roland Roberts for president. Uh, and so I also want to point out the other spreadsheet that is mentioned that is there, and that is uh, a prayer-a-thon. Uh, there are people who are going to be praying and many fasting for the 72 hours prior and during this election, January 15th. And so if you click that, you are able to sign up for whichever one you would like to uh, be on, and that will be happening even during the night. So for 72 hours, for three days prior and during the event, uh, we'll have people praying uh, for us, both in the United States and around the world. We're so grateful for every one of you that uh, are, are participating and being a part. Uh, I want to give, is there any other guests that we want to acknowledge tonight? If so, I haven't seen any of the other hands raised, but if so, kindly, very quickly, unmute, give your word of support, and I will close us out for this evening. Can I come in quick, real quick, yes, please? Thank you. Welcome. Yes, thank you, Dr. Roberts. Yeah, um, there are a couple of people from Iowa. Uh, he, one of them is, uh, he go as AKA Brown Brown, but he's Charles. And then I have a uh, brother, Sar Pastor Cyrus. And then I see that our Liberian president of the Liberian Association, um, Mr. Dolly is here, and of course, we all know Pastor Sussex. And then we do have uh, Brother Rufus Brown is here. 
And anyone else, I just want to recognize that. And then uh, Mr. Miller, which is from Virginia, we all know him by now. And uh, he's participating. So I just hope, hopefully I didn't leave anyone out. And we have some new members that we put in the chat room. One of them, I think, Whitford and, um, yeah, a couple of them. From Ghana and from Cameroon. So we have more people teaming up with us. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. I Would one of you kindly unmute and uh, be able to give us a word of greeting? One of the guests, please unmute from Iowa, please. Mr. Mr. Doddy, Mr. Doddy, are you able to come up just say a word for a second, please? Hi, it's Richard Hernandez. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I was invited by Miguel Valise to listen in on your introduction and your your background. I was impressed. I have we actually have a lot in common because I have bought, I started buying a lot, quite a few properties when I was 19, and by the time I was 25, I had about five five homes. So we have a lot in common in that, and real estate investments and. So uh, I've also uh, seen you in person at a, uh, I think it was a conference. It was a like Latino business conference. I think that's the last time I saw you. So, uh, it was very interesting to hear your background and uh, um, mm -hmm. I look forward to your success as a president. Ooh, thank you so much, Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. It is great to see you. Uh, I remember being in Columbus for a Latino uh, Business Awards conference and uh, Senior Miguel Viles, who is on tonight. I saw him flash up on the screen. Senior Viles, go ahead and say hello. Hello, hello everyone. How are you today? Hola. Uh, quiero introducir a Alberto. He wants to introduce uh, Alberto. Alberto, que está muy interesado. He's very interested en conocernos. in meeting uh, the whole caucus. Y ver cómo es que vamos procediendo. And seeing how we're going to, you know, move on to the future. Cómo es eso. How the, how, how, tiene bendecido. how the process is to, you know, be blessed by God. To, para mi, para mirar al nuevo presidente. to meet the new president and all that, you know. Only in my hand. Only in his hands. And his head. Es, Visual, visualizo, he te visualizo did, como presidente. He just visualizes you, Mr. Ro no veo otro, Roland, no as, otra, no as otra, no tengo otra cosa en la cabeza. He just doesn't have anything else in his mind. Visualizándote como presidente. He just visualizes you as the, as the future president. Mr. Alberto, bienvenido. Le presento a Mr. Roland Roberts for president. Thank you, Senior Viles. Thank you. Mr. Alberto, you're welcome. Thank you for joining. Uh, if you'd like to un unmute, you're welcome to say a word, but we're glad you're here. It's a pleasure, Dr. Roberts. Uh, it's a pleasure being here uh, and an honor. I will be following your campaign and uh, I'm very excited about what I've heard tonight. Uh, and uh, But the most exciting part of this is uh, that for the first time, I hear God being the lead yes. and center of attention. And that is really um, something different and unique for me. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're glad that you are. We're very grateful for you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Most welcome every time. Uh, let me turn to Mr. Curtis Dorley. Uh, Mr. Dorley, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello. Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, because of my location, I try to adjust very well. So my name is Curtis Dolly. Uh, I am a. I'm the president. Sorry, uh, what is this? Uh, technology is. <laughs> It's not in your best interest tonight, huh? <laughs> yeah, I try to come on. I want, my, I want to show my face. Uh, let me see. But uh, I am the president of the Liberian Association of Iowa. 
and uh, we are actually a not-for-profit organization. Uh, so we are also a representation of our community. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to be here uh, to represent our community, not in the capacity uh, for not-for-profit, but we have a very huge immigrant community here in Iowa. And we really believe that leadership the world over uh, has been taken from the people of God. So if you have one of our people, a Christian, uh, especially for this nation who wants to come forward to be able to represent uh, the country, we think it is a very good initiative. And we as immigrate, uh, immigration community, the immigrant community, uh, we're looking forward to somebody who we can work with. I'm happy that you have very good experience uh, about Africans. You do work and live in Africa for some time. You know who we are, you know what we stand for. And we're looking forward to getting closer to somebody like you that will be able to speak for us. Somebody who knows our problems, some of the challenges that minority communities are facing in the United States. Yes. Yes, thank you, Mr. Dorley. So thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to me tonight. And I want to thank Sis Marie, who also comes from our community. We're looking forward to work uh, to make this dream a reality. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Dorley. We very much appreciate the, your words, your wisdom, uh, and, and your support. I, I, and and you, you said something that's very important, I think, for me. I, every person, regardless of uh, their professional capacity, is allowed to endorse uh, every pastor in America, every bishop, every priest, every prophet, every uh, CEO of every nonprofit, they're all allowed to personally endorse and support any candidate they want. Uh, organizations, there's different uh, rules, but the individuals are able to do it. And, and so we strongly encourage uh, people to exercise their voice. Um, and that's certainly what I'm doing on behalf of so many people who have not been given a voice. You know, that's one of the most wonderful parts about this miracle in Iowa that's happening. To mobilize this many thousands of people in the, over the next nine days uh, is bigger than any of us. Only God can do it. We know that. Uh, but what's beautiful about it is that it's not my name that's going to get lifted up after this. They're going to say, how did this happen? And the answer is you. It's each of you. And it will elevate people and groups and voices that have been silenced and have never had a platform in the United States. And all of a sudden, you went just like David from having no platform to being the ones in authority that everyone needs the support and endorsement in, uh, for any political type of gain in the future. And so I think that is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, if it was all about me, then that's not winning. Uh, that's selfish. That's narcissistic. It's, but when it's about us, when everybody rises, that's when you know it's healthy and you know it's right. So I want to thank you for being on. Uh, and Honorable Miller, I want to, uh, Richard Miller, I'd like you to unmute. And if you'd like to give a word of greeting, it is wonderful to see you, sir. Uh, for those who, who weren't here uh, the other night, uh, the Honorable Richard Miller, he is a former uh, presidential candidate in Liberia. He lives in the United States now, and uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert and everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Mari, Scott Wilson, thank you again uh, for bringing me uh, on board. Uh, thank you so much because uh, 
every night that we, we come together, um, you know, we exalt the Lord. Uh, and everyone is so passionate about the reason why uh, we're supporting you. You know, one of the things you said, Dr. Robert, that, that sort of uh, caught my heart. I remember in Liberia, because this election that just ended, I was one of 20th, 20 uh, presidential candidates running. So obviously I didn't win, but I had no idea I wanted to be caught up in anything as far as politics, even at the highest level. But uh, I think in terms of uh, when we talk about prayer, uh, the importance of prayer. And so we, we uh, you know, especially not just Liberians, but as a Liberian, you know, our background and, and how we grew up, uh, God is center in our lives and prayer is very important. So I got involved in this, uh, my candidacy because I got a message from uh, someone from church that the Lord uh, wants me to get involved. And I said, to be involved in what? So, you know, like you, it was, um, it wasn't my, my own intuition to get involved in this level, at this level. But then I, uh, I prayed about it. I said, God, what, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't have the resources that the, a lot of people have. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not popular. I, you know, I'm just a regular person. I'm a business guy, you know? So I've been in, doing a lot of things in Liberia. I have businesses there. And, and but I said, you know, I, I'm not, you know, people don't know who I am. So, but at the end of the day, like you, Dr. Robert is like, when, when God calls, and the thing is, we're wondering, like in my thoughts, throughout the whole campaign, I kept saying to myself, I tried not to allow doubts because it was clear to me that it wasn't necessarily that even if I didn't win this election, which uh, someone else won, but what God wanted to do through me for Liberia has not ended, it's the beginning. But God needed to bring me into the arena. So like for you, when I listen to you, like I, you know, I, I just, I'm just so overwhelmed because I don't know, you know, the Holy Spirit can carry us into places where we're like, I never thought I would make the time to follow up any politician here in the US. But I'm telling you, you are, um, like everyone has said, Every time you speak, it's like uh, the Holy Spirit just, it's like that, that, that feeling in your heart that many people hear on this call and outside of this call. When somebody is talking about the Lord and, and they're talking and they know that they can't do anything. Dr. Robert, there's nothing that we can do. Only God can make it happen and because of God, is why you're here, is why you're here. And so we're grateful to God. Um, I go back and forth. I live in Liberia and then I come here uh, for a short period of time. Then I go back. But as much as I was disappointed, Dr. Robert, after the election was over, the last thing I was saying, I, was, I said to the Lord, I said, why didn't I win? I said, God, you send a message that I will win and be president of Liberia. 2023, what, why didn't that happen? And, you know, the spirit just sort of put in my heart that um, Isaiah 55, verse 11. And that's the message that kept coming to me that, you know, what the Lord's word that goes out when I come back empty. So for you, Dr. Robert, that word that has gone out, that has gone your spirit, for which you see people from worldwide that are supporting you, it's just only the Holy Spirit that can do that. So we'll continue to pray and for everybody else, um, the campaign 
for us to continue to be hopeful, work together, and to give God the glory in all things. Because at the end of the day, you're, I mean, really, you're, it's time for, for the world to have believers, right? People who trust in the Lord to take the mantle. So thank you so much again, Dr. Robert, and everybody uh, for the opportunity uh, to share. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, let me go ahead and turn to the, the individual who has their hand raised. Uh, the floor is yours. Kind of unmute. Is um, Mr. Charles Brown Brown. Yes. Good evening, good evening, everybody. God bless everybody. God bless our president more and more and more and more. President Rora, God bless you. Amen. God, more and more. <laughs> so when we talk about faith, you know, so I'm you, you, you I can see you, you're already my president, you're already our president in America. Yeah. So there is no doubt on that. And it's true that we are talking about spirituality. We are talking about God. When this year started, I say I have two things, prayer and work, prayer and work. We pray and we work more. By the, by the way, my name is Charles Fapondonshi. That's my real name. And uh, I'm a comedian. So if I owe your money, if you go and look for Charles Donshi, you will never know Charles Donshi. Nobody will know me. But if you say I'm looking for Bram Bram, yes. <laughs> I will give my money to Bram Bram. Yeah. I'm also, uh, I have a nonprofit who is called Bram Bram Foundation. Uh, uh, I'm a leader, a Kimonian leader in the community. So everybody already know me. And I don't stop only in the Cameroon community because even the Liberia community, everybody. Some of them, many of them, they know me. And uh, I believe in prayers. I believe in God. And I believe in hard work. Yeah, I believe in hard work. Just to say, uh, my president, together we're going to make it. We already make it happen. We already make it happen. And we're going to continue. We are all winners. And president, we support you with everything, with all our power, all our soul, everything. We are together with you. Thank you. That's what I can say for now. Thank you so much. Wow. I'm glad we ended on Brown Brown. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> what, a, what a word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Success and Dr. Marie uh, and, and all of the others for and the guests that were with us tonight. Uh, don't forget to support us financially. You can do it at RolandRoberts.com or the links in the chat. Uh, we have one link if it's a smaller amount, and then there's a link if it's uh, a larger amount. Uh, I I was having fun with uh, the team the other day, and I said, let's post something on social media and say, if you think you need to change for America to be better, donate $1. If you think that er others need to change for America to be better, donate 1000 because everybody, nobody thinks they're the problem, right? <laughs> uh, and so we were, we were having some fun, so we have a couple of different links there, but uh, please hit the link, support us. We've got a lot of expenses, even over the next week with, with Iowa, uh, things that we're doing and mobilizing. And uh, we'll, we're, we're on the ground there. And, uh, and so uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, the victory uh, on January 15th. No, they're not even seeing it coming. We are going to be the biggest political spoiler in recent U.S. history. And it is because of this team and because, like Brown Brown said, the work, the work, it is actually showing up on January 15th. It is actually mobilizing thousands of people in nine days. But there's a cause. This isn't just because we have a guy. It's not because we just have a candidate. This is unlike anything else. This is the miracle in Iowa. And I'm grateful to each one of you. Have a great night. We'll see you again tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern. 7 p.m. Central. God bless each of you. Good night. Thank you.